Welcome to the Reduce Cyber Risk Podcast, May 13th, 2019, episode 36. Welcome to the Reduce Cyber Risk Podcast, where we provide you the training and tools you need to pass the CISSP exam while enhancing your cybersecurity career. Hi, my name is Sean Gerber, and I'm your host for this action-packed, informative podcast. Join me each week as I provide the information you need to grow your cybersecurity knowledge so that you're better prepared to pass the CISSP exam. All right, let's get going. Hey, y'all, it's Sean Gerber again with Reduced Cyber Risk, and we have a wonderful podcast planned for you this week. It's incredible as always. Uh, at least just ask myself that question or just point at yeah, something like that. Okay, hey guys, so just wanted to talk to you about some changes we're making to reduce cyber risk. Um, and so we're going to just do a little bit of a pivot, just a tiny one, um, around some of the things as we deal with cybersecurity and um, how it works with what we call the certification for the CISSP. So we're going to provide, um, basically, Reduce Cyber Risk is going to be providing you training that you need to pass the CISSP exam. And if you're not familiar with the CISSP, it is the Certified Information System Security Professional. And what it is, is it's the granddaddy of all cybersecurity exams and certifications. Um, and yes, it is a bugger to pass. But the good part about it is, is that it is your the exam that you need to be a CISSP, and it takes forever to pass it. However, it is awesome once you have it. And we're also going to integrate CISSP and cybersecurity during these discussions. So what I've learned as a CISSP, um, one thing is that as an, and as a CISO, Chief Information Security Officer for a company, and through all my cybersecurity career, is that they are intertwined. The CISSP and uh, cybersecurity are all intertwined and they are work together. So the whole purpose of this is to provide you that level of training you need. Now, if you're a person that's a business owner, you'll still enjoy some of the CISSP training that I provide, uh, or you know, it'll help your business be more secure. So the good part about all this is that they work hand in hand, but the focus is going to be primarily on the CISSP. Uh, now we're going to, they have three main focus areas that I am going to focus on specifically. And I said focus three times in one sentence. That's pretty amazing, actually. Um, I didn't know you could actually do that. And probably if you're an English major out there, you're probably going, uh, <laughs> no, you can't do that. But I just did. Um, RCR focus, reduce cyber risk focus is going to be on CISSP and cybersecurity integration, you know, basically how do you work from the CISSP and how do you integrate that with cybersecurity? We're also going to focus on CISSP training, very specific training to pass the certification for the CISSP exam. Uh, at Reduce Cyber Risk, I've got training out there on the CISSP exam, as well as you're going to be getting weekly trainings on how to pass the exam. Now, as I throw out the disclaimer, nothing that I provide you can guarantee any sort of passing from the exam. However, it is a great tool to be able to get you to the next level and to help you during that testing. Exam, uh, testing. Uh, the last thing is going to be I'm going to be providing CISSP exam questions. What are some questions that you're, you potentially could see on the CISSP exam? Uh, and so we're also going to talk about strategies around the exam and some of the things that people have run into. The big thing with that exam is, yeah, it just tries to trick you in many cases and just see if you're actually paying attention to the actual test. All right. Now, so we get started, as we talked about the three focus areas, first one is going to be the CISSP and cybersecurity integration. Now, as I talk about that, I've got a news article from Business News Daily. Now, the thing that they put this out there was back, I think, in April of 2019. Um, and the purpose of this article is to talk about the CISSP and what are some different things that you can expect. Well, they're basically talking about the shortage of cyber secure, security skilled professionals. So if you're going to study your CISSP, and we've talked about this at length in my course, and also we've talked about it before on the actual uh, Reduce Cyber Risk podcast, but the bottom line is you have to have five years experience to be a CISSP. They have some opportunities for you to get into that that profession or into the certification early, but they expect security professionals who have had a lot of time to be working on their CISSP. Now, the point of that, though, is that there's a shortage of, of skilled professionals in that you do not have to be a CISSP to do that. You can actually just be one of the security analysts, and I say just, is that you can work your way up into the that 
exam. Uh, but the bottom line is there's a shortage of cyber skilled, cybersecurity skilled professionals. And they're saying in the United States, there's about a half a million that will be short by the year 2022 is what I saw. Now, I, these numbers vary wildly. I, I'd be just perfectly honest. I've kind of, I, I've, I kind of put this out there where I've seen the number consistently with the United States of about a half a million. Uh, but I just read from this Business uh, News Daily article that they they are expecting almost four million globally, and and that's so I've seen as high as two and a half and or as low as two and a half and as high now as four million globally. So there it's a huge uh, gap that's going to be growing in the cybersecurity space. So if you're going to be getting into this world, it's a good time to get in. Um, there's basically saying there's about ten thousand jobs that are posted almost daily on the major uh, what do you call it recruiting websites around cybersecurity. So again, good good time to be getting involved. Um, what you're going to look to, the key thing to do is as you're trying to get into these careers is that the CISSP in many cases, especially for the senior level roles, is a requirement to have. Uh, so if you are looking to get down this path, I would recommend that you start studying for it now or start at least planning for it. And reduce cyber risk is a good way to help you with that. But even if you are just a, you're working as a security analyst and you don't think that at this point you can take your CISSP, Reduce cyber risk can help you with just kind of getting get getting ready for that test. Now, one thing to consider also is you have to be endorsed by a CISSP if you once you go for that exam. Um, and this is kind of what they talked about: is that you need to prepare, you need to pass it, and you need to be endorsed by a, a certified information security professional. Now, they also mentioned in their article that there's other certifications on the path to becoming a CISSP. And these are ones that I, I actually recommend. I've been certified in these as well. And they are a really good enhancement to getting the overall certification. Uh, there's A plus certification, which deals with hardware, Security Plus, obviously security, uh, Network Plus, which deals with the networking aspects. And then I also recommend that you get the certified ethical hacker course. Um, having that course actually provides you a level of knowledge around what the how does a hacker think so as you become uh, a senior person within an organization understanding how the hacker would approach a, a situation uh, and what do they do i think is very very valuable uh, my, my years working in the red as a red teamer uh, was very very valuable i believe as a security person within our organization now there's also the system security certified professional which is cc or cscp now, this is kind of a lower level below the CISSP, and what it does is it has many of the same domains that you would get in the CISSP exam. So it kind of sets you up for success. And we'll talk about that in Reduce Cyber Risk as long as well as some of the CC, the CSSCP uh, and some of the domains around that, and maybe some of the integrations that roll into that certification. Now, if you're looking for the CISSP, there's also some concentrations that you can focus on. Now, these are the add-on aspects of that certification. There's the ISS Alpha Papa, so the India Sierra Sierra Alpha Papa, India Sierra Sierra Echo Papa, and India Sierra Sierra Mike Papa. Okay, so yeah, there's an A, an Echo, and a Mike Papa. Basically, it's architecture, engineering, and management. Those are different concentrations that you can focus on as a CISSP. So it's a great article, kind of talked about what you need to worry about as you're working through the CISSP exam. And uh, I highly recommend you check it out at, at uh, the, the article that will be posted on the show notes within the podcast. All right, let's roll on to the training. Okay, here's the CISSP training. It's going to be domain three, wiring closets and intermediate distribution facilities. All right, so you're dealing with a wiring closet, and in this objective, you'll see this in the CISSP exam, uh, is there's there's a different kind of takeaways to consider as you're dealing with all of this. Now, what are some key points around wiring closets is the fact that they contain the most critical aspects of your business. And so therefore, it's imperative that you do things to properly protect them. So one of the things that would come into play is that you have the the proper uh, airflow, you have the proper air conditioning. And as if you've probably figured out and you've probably been in the, this world for a while, and especially as you're dealing with the CISSP, uh, you probably had to manage some level of uh, security or some level of network administration for your organization is that proper air conditioning and airflow for these highly, uh, uh, what do you call it, processing systems that create a lot of heat. And if they create a lot of heat, therefore they get warm. And if they get warm and they get too warm, they shut down. 
So it's imperative that you have the proper air conditioning and airflow within the wiring closet that you may have the uh, information at or your um, computer systems at. Also ensure that it remains locked with limited access. That's one of the things you'll see from an auditing standpoint is that you got to limit the access to that room. You have a couple of things that can happen. You can have individuals who could cause physical harm. You could have individuals who would just plug into the uh, wiring harnesses that you may have or the switches that you may have there and just connect to your network. So it's imperative that you keep these rooms and these, these closets locked with limited access. Uh, never use as a general storage area. And I've seen some crazy things. I've seen one where the server is sitting in a bathroom right above the toilet. Um, also, unless you are part of the last campaign for president and you have Hillary Clinton, you have them in a bathroom as well. Not a good place to have them because, one, there's lots of people use the things, right? So it can cause lots of issues. Um, also, the fact is, is that there's usually moisture. And if there's moisture in computer systems, they don't do so well together. So ensure that you do have them in a location that is not access to general access, that is available, that is more or less segregated off to itself. Um, they need to keep them clean and free of de debris as well. And that comes into is don't use places where you would store flammable aspects. You wouldn't have a place where you do your cleaning products and so forth. Uh, it's again, it, keep them in a place by themselves because they are an electronic device and electronic devices can have electric shorts and stuff like that causing issues. So again, uh, make sure that you put them in places where they are not next to flammable items. Also, if you have the availability to add some level of video surveillance, it's highly recommended. Uh, one, as a, I, I like to call it on the psychological operations, it is if, if a person tries to get in there and they see there's cameras on the door, the odds are high they're going to leave that place alone. Just simply fact is that they know there's some sort of video monitoring of them. It could be real time, it could be recorded, but at the end of the day, there is video recording. Uh, so it works as a as a way to keep people out or keep let people know that you are watching. Um, also, it, it does provide some level of providing an audit or of in the fact that there is an event, you can go back and look at that video recordings. But there's many other takeaways as well, but these are just a couple that you need to really highly consider as you're dealing with wiring closets. Now, as we're gonna get into an objective, there's one objective in the CISSP is server rooms and data centers. And some key takeaways around that is, again, we talked about having air conditioning and airflow, but another one is raised floors and cable trays. In many cases, that you, it's wise to have raised floors set up specifically for uh, your data room or data center. And the simple fact of it is you, all the wiring can run down below underneath the, the the wiring cabinets okay the purpose of that though is also is to get airflow if you have airflow that's rolling underneath the the flooring as well as airflow that's inside that all is a huge help for keeping the temperature down in that room now you also want to avoid trying to put anything on the ground floor where possible the reason is is that if you have flooding you have any of those aspects you can cause massive issues because i've seen it where in the case where there's a data center it's in the bottom of the basement and then they right next to the water supply well what happens if the water supply has a leak well yeah you're toast uh, so it's highly recommended you do not put those on the ground floor or in the basement uh, some aspects around the wiring closets you need to also consider as you're dealing with uh, cable trays and so forth is how do you have the wiring above the thing i've seen it where you instead of having it underneath you'll have the, the the cable trays will be above the actual server rooms or the um, wiring cabinets or i should say yeah server cabinets and the power will or the the connectivity will roll down through above you and then down into the wiring cabinets so there's a lot of different ways around that that you can set it up depending upon your situation also recommend you have an uninterrupted power supply, which is considered what they call a UPS. Typically what these are is just like a huge battery or a bank of batteries, and they are not designed to keep your system up and running for a long period of time. They're, they're designed to ha let you have a controlled shutdown of your power of your computer system so that in the event that there's a power outage, uh, you can go in there, you can, you can keep them up for a very short period of time if it's just kind of a spike, but if it's not, it gives you the ability to go in and, and shut these things down versus having them just have a hard shutdown. And as we all know, hard shutdowns with computer systems are always not a good option. So those are some things around that. Okay, so we're dealing with server rooms and data centers. There, and there are various security mechanisms in place. One is a smart card. And this is kind of an IBD badge, um, and it can contain information for access. Now, it's very similar 
to your uh, proximity readers that we'll talk about next, but it's a, it can have information on your access and you can plug it into something. Um, and typically the smart cars will have like a chip or something along those lines. And you can design it to have a pin or not to have a pin. It just right, kind of comes down to you and your organization and how it's set up. Uh, but it's usually like a chip that you'd have on your credit card. And you just plug it in. It it reads that uh, little chip that's there and verifies are you the person you you say you are. And that's kind of what happens with credit cards right now. Is all that chip really does is it verifies that you have physical access to the to the card itself, and then the pin that's on that chip will verify that if you know that pin. So it's just something to consider around that. Now, as you're dealing with proximity readers which these are RFIDs and these are radio frequency identification devices, they are a passive control to physical access. And basically what it comes down to is, is you have your card, you hold it up to a little pad, and I call it the beep beep. And what it does is it beeps, it lets you in, and then from there you can just keep on migrating in. And a lot of times I'll put these in place of or in lieu of or in addition to a man trap, which would be you'd beep to get in, and then when the door would go in, the door would close behind you, and then it would allow you in over a period of time. Uh, so these are those are proximity readers. And they you can get these a lot of times also in, uh, they, they use them from a data protection standpoint or a physical theft standpoint, where they will put those on DVDs, clothes, anything of high value. They'll put these RFID uh, tags inside the case or inside the clothing uh, that so when you walk through a, a field that you can't you basically can't throw it over the the field it'll go off it goes and makes a bunch of noise so an example i bought a, um, a new door handle for my front door of my house well it's it's an expensive door handle so as an expensive door handle they have a little beep beep inside it and they don't want people walking off with it and it's not very it's pretty small you could it'd be relatively easy to walk out of the the building with it so therefore they have that rfid tag on or inside the box to keep people from physically stealing it all right so now on to the cissp exam questions this is domain one what is the most important purpose of an employee exit interview All right, so the question is, is this, what is the most important purpose of an employee exit interview? And we're going to go through a couple different options. Alpha is confirm your job description is accurate. B, bravo, <laughs> B, ensure that your onboard offboarding process is correct. Charlie, ensure that exiting employee has personal belongings. And Delta, review the standing non-disclosure agreement. So you're probably all asking yourself, I don't know. Or some of you are probably going, duh, that's pretty easy. So the point of this is, is one, you want to, when you confirm your job description is accurate, well, if you're on your exit interview, um, what do you think? You think that's really useful? <laughs> probably not. Because if your job description is you're leaving, um, I guess that it comes down to is the HR person may ask, hey, is this really correct? So Because we're going to hire your backfill on that one. No, that's not the, that's not the correct one. Uh, you want to ensure your onboarding and offboarding process is correct. I, I don't know if they're a good resource to help you during that your offboarding process. If it's correct, they may just tell you what you want to hear just so they can leave. Um, Charlie, as you ensure the exit employee has personal belongings, well, that was kind of a given, right? You're going to make sure if, if I'm leaving a company, I'm going to make sure I got my stuff, right? I'm not going to leave my stuff for you. Uh, so that's that's kind of not the most important part of an, a personal or of an exit interview. And Delta, review the standing non-disclosure agreement. That was probably the most appropriate. Now, all of those may have some level of truthfulness, you know, because you could help you with uh, your onboarding, offboarding process. It can help you with your personal belongings and also help with the job description if they're really, really helpful. But bottom line is, is you want to review the not the standing non-disclosure agreement. And the question is why? Well, during an exit interview, it's extremely important that HR does this. And the reason is, is because when a person's leaving the company, especially if they have access to sensitive information for the company, you want to make sure they understand uh, this isn't your information and we don't want you going and sharing it with other people. Now, in many cases, this may not be the case of you may not have to do this because one, maybe the information is not that sensitive Two, uh, you know, it's really not that big of a deal. But it's also, I think, important for HR folks to to go and make a comment to uh, the individuals around going, hey, you know, even though you created some work product for us, 
working for this company X, you know, you that is company X's work product and you can't go and take that someplace else. Now, especially if you're dealing with highly sensitive information, I've seen this before where you had a situation where they are dealing with R&D and they have access to very, very sensitive information, then they need to have a non-disclosure agreement in place and they need to make sure that they're aware of it. Here's a gotcha. If you're working on your CISSP, which we are because you're listening to our podcast, one of the considerations is, is that if you need people to have a non-disclosure agreement, you better consider it, uh, especially with their in sort of some sort of uh, sensitive information. Now, non-disclosure agreements can be worked through, and I've seen it happen already, but it still is important to do that uh, and have that in place. Okay, in this scenario, we're going to talk about the employee and contractor working for a company. And this scenario is kind of designed to the fact that it's going to walk you through what you need to be aware of as it relates to having someone working for you. And th this is an interesting part is that you, these are things that I've run into, I've heard other people run into. So I use this, if you're working on your CISSP, this is a great way for you to kind of get an idea of what you should be considering with the companies you get started with. So in this scenario, you have an employer contractor working with company X and they build or create a widget of some kind. Now this widget could be intellectual property from a physical something that you would patent to as simple something as simple as just a process by which you do business. All of these things uh, need to be considered as in, um, some sort of work product or and it may be like an example like the guy that created the LEDs, uh, the most recent one there the highest viewing LEDs, right? They they struggled for years to create LEDs that could go in multiple colors other than the reds and the greens and I think the blues one of those but they, they finally got one that could do white. And that was a huge deal, That one, uh, an LED that could actually do white. Well, this was actually, he may have gotten some money off of that, but that IP that he created, that patent, is work is for the company who helped create the LED. It's not his. Um, depending upon how you sign up your contracts, that's the way it works in most cases. So, But what happens is employees and contractors will feel that the data they worked on was created by them, and therefore it belongs to them. That's not the case in many cases. Now, again, that's not always, but you need to work with your security, with your intellectual property team to understand that. Now, we got employee or contractor X who's approached by somebody as a recruiter on LinkedIn. Well, right, most people are on LinkedIn and these recruiters go out and they will fish for people. Well, now they approach him and this guy goes, yeah, man, that sounds great. I'm going to take my stuff with me. Well, the question is, is, is that possible? You know, does, did, is, the, is the recruiter or is the individual able to take their IP with them? Well, in most, like we said before, in most cases, that cannot be the case. So in the case of an NDA, if you have an NDA during the exit interview, it's a great way to reaffirm the situation that, hey, uh, Billy Bob, you have an NDA in place and you're not supposed to go talk to people about this. Uh, or you may have a time frame on that. Now, that's something you need to work out because, again, if you make it indefinite, uh, they probably can shoot holes and stuff like that. But um, again, I'm not a lawyer. And I ignore what I play when on TV. I would recommend you talk to your lawyers around this, but an NDA is a good aspect to have in place. Now, NDA training during the year is also a great way to supplement the employee knowledge around this topic. Highly recommend you do that. Don't just wait till the end and bring it up. If you keep telling people about this and making it in the forefront of their mind, it's a great way to kind of stave off disaster. All right, these are links for the training we had today at ISC Squared Training Study Guide, April 2018. Great resource for you. Also, Business News Daily is a great place. There we got that uh, article around the CISSPs and all the jobs that are being created. All right, I hope you enjoyed this training with Reduce Cyber Risk. Check us out online at ReduceCyberRisk.com. See ya. Thanks so much for joining me today on my podcast. If you like what you heard, please leave a review on iTunes as I would greatly appreciate your feedback. Also, check out my CISSP videos that are on YouTube. Just search for Sean, that's S-H-O-N, Gerber, and you'll find a plethora of content to help you pass the CISSP exam. Lastly, head over to Reduce Cyber Risk and look at the cornucopia of free CISSP materials available to all my email subscribers. Thanks again for listening. See ya.